So I guess we should get going. The first speaker is Yu Tsang, and he speaks about hadronic charm decays at best three. And yes, please go ahead. I will notify you five minutes before time is up. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear okay. you very well. So, okay. So I'll talk about some recent results on the, the hadronic charm decays measure that uh, best three. So this includes some uh, the strong phase parameters in neutral D meson decays and some uh, results or other amplitude analysis and uh, uh, branching fraction measurements. So at best three, we have uh, collected data set uh, for D zero, D zero by and D plus D minus uh, at a near threshold. threshold. And uh, we have also collected the data uh, for DS uh, study uh, of DS star and DS bar, uh, DS pairs. And uh, the, so we can, we can rec reconstruct only one D meson, which is called a single tag method. And we, all, we can also reconstruct both of the D mesons, which is called a double tag method. With this double tag method, we can uh, measure the absolute differential fractions of charm mesons and uh, the systematics in the tag side can, um, can be almost canceled out. So I show some uh, examples of fit, example fits for the DS and the D mesons here. And with with this single tag can, uh, events, we uh, we can have a very clean environment for study of various uh, decays. As this the continuum background can be highly expressed by reconstructing the uh, in the, the D candidate in the single tag side. So, for the strong phase prime uh, uh, measurement, uh, the neutral D meson pairs uh, produced at the nearest threshold uh, is in uh, is quantum correlated and in C odd uh, state. And uh, by measuring the double decay rates of both the D and D bar meson, the quantum correlation effect can provide us access to the strong phase parameters in the D decay. So we can, uh, we, we, we can re reconstruct the uh, uh, D meson in the single tag side with uh, different uh, states, the CP, CP eigenstates, the flavor states, and the self conjugate states. This, these tags can provide us the different sensitivity on the strong phase parameter, parameters. So these uh, D strong phase parameters uh, is, are, are essential inputs to the, uh, uh, the gamma angle measurement. Uh, which is uh, usually measured with the B two D K and D bar K, and the D D bar uh, decays into the final uh, same final states, and this is uh, the direct measurement. And compared to the indirect measurement overfitted by the other CKM matrix elements, the uh, uncertainty is still very large and receives a, a non-zero uncertainty from these D decay parameters. There are usually two leading D decays contributing to the gamma di direct measurement. Well, the first is uh, reconstructing the D in the K short pi pi uh, K and K short KK uh, final state, which is called the BPGGSZ method. And the uh, uh, second is the ADS method by reconstructing the D in uh, decays into the K. Uh, uh, flavor tag, uh, flavor modes like K three pi. So we have at best three, we have measured the strong phase parameters in these two decays for K short pi pi. To usually for uh, the uh, for this D uh, multiple D decay and to maximize the gamma sensitivity, the uh, K short pi pi phase space uh, can be divided uh, did into different beans uh, on the uh, k-short pi plus and k-short pi minus uh, studies plot. 
as shown in the uh, left plot, uh, the top plot. And in these beams, the strong phase parameters uh, can be param parameterized in the, uh, with the CI and SI parameters. And we can, at best, we can measure these uh, parameters. In the bo bottom plot, uh, I, these are the uh, double tag events uh, of K-short pi pi tagged with CP eigenstates. Uh, we can see that the these double decay rates vary uh, are different in the uh, symmetric regions over the cache of pi pi dotted plot due to quantum correlation effect. And uh, by exploiting this uh, effect, the quantum correlation effects, we measure the uh, strong phase parameters uh, in the cache of pi pi as in the left hand side plot, the red. Red dots are best three results, and the uh, blue, uh, green dots are, are the clear C results. We can see that the, uh, we, we, the, there's a significant improvement uh, relating to, uh, so the best three import, inputs will contribute to the gamma uh, 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 angle uncertainty with about uh, one degree, and can, which is uh, yeah, and this leading this leads to the best single gamma uh, measurement uh, with a um, total uncertainty of about five degrees. And similarly, we have measured the uh, CI and SI parameters in the cache of KK decay, uh, which this this measurement is done in with a two binning method due to less stat statistics. And for the K, D2K3 pi, and we also study the phase variations in the five dimensional K3 pi phase space which, uh, to improve the sensitivity on gamma from the uh, left hand side plot, uh, from the right hand side plot. You can see that to compare uh, the uh, sensitivity on gamma can be uh, much improved by the binning method with the binning method compared to the unbind method. So the plot the plot in the left shows the best three results for in the four K3 high beams. And yeah this this result is uh, significantly improved compared to the clear C results. And uh, from a toy study we find the uh, gamma uh, measured with this D two K three pi decay will be will be the uncertainty will be around eight degree with out of which six comes from the uh, best three inputs. The, this mode serves as uh, the second leg leading contribution to to the gamma direct measurement next to K short pi pi. And next, uh, I will talk about some very different uh, amplitude analysis results and the branching fraction measurements. So we have done some uh, amplitude analysis for D S two K short K short pi. The the top plot shows the uh, event we observed in data, and uh, we describe the intermediate resonances with spread Wigner function functions and. Uh, uh, there's only two components that is uh, significant in the in 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 data, and uh, we we don't found the we, we didn't find the uh, contribution from the uh, uh, scalars around uh, nine eighty. <clears throat> this is due to that their uh, the interference between them are destructive. So. Yeah, and uh, the re we the resonance we found a resonance around uh, seventeen ten for the yeah we to improve to to impress this scalar we measure the branch we measure measure this branch and the branch fraction of this intermediate uh, channel and. Uh, it, it should be a mixture of the 
F0 and A0 scalars. And then the interference between these two scalars uh, should be uh, constructive in this, uh, in this channel. And this can be used as an explanation to our recent result of the DS2 KK pi, where these, these two scalars are not formed in the, with an amplitude analysis. And we also expect the charged uh, partner for the A0 uh, to be observed in the DS2 K short K plus pi zero decay. And, and this result is uh, expected to uh, publish soon. Uh, five minutes left. Yeah, thank you. And we also reported uh, the first observation of the D0 to omega phi. Uh, and we measured the branch fraction of this decay and uh, we, we found it is consistent with some model predictions, but uh, uh, yeah. Uh, inconsistent with others. So it's, it can serve as a very good channel to test the various uh, theoretical tools. And we also measure the polarization in this decay. We found that the omega and phi are purely transversely polarized. And this is uh, different from the model predictions and it uh, uh, certainly requires closer look at the underlying dynamics in this decay and other D zero decays into two vectors. And uh, for the, uh, the last is a uh, double capable spread decay of D two K pi 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 zero. So we use a flavor, uh, we use a flavor specific uh, single tax for this decay and uh, it can helps to reduce uh, the other uh, uh, cross feed from the yeah from the capable favor the background in the D zero decay channels and we use the uh, uh, two variables to reconstruct the neutri missing neutrino and the plot shows the uh, uh, feed to the missing mass square distribution uh, distributions and the the branch fraction is found to be very large at uh, ten to minus three level uh, this. This should be caused by the intermediate, intermediate resonances and the final state interactions in this decay. So this table lists uh, uh, the uh, study of other many other channels that have been studied in the past past year, and uh, this dec multi-body decays are rich of intermediate resonances and uh, provide our so important knowledge for underlying uh, for the uh, understanding the underlying dynamics and the calibrated theoret theoretical predictions and uh, uh, our sensitivity have reached uh, the level to the double A surprise decay as listed in the bottom two channels. So to summarize, at best we have a very unique quantum correlated DD bar. Uh, data set to enable us to measure the strong phase parameters, providing inputs for the gamma angle measurements and uh, also the charm mix and uh, CP violation studies. And uh, we have very clean data sets for precision measurements of uh, various hydronic charm decays. And uh, in the future, by next year, we will collect uh, 20 inverse window bar. Uh, DD bar data at uh, threshold, uh, which will significantly improve the, the this all these parameters, especially benefit the the strong phase parameter measurement. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much for the very nice talk, showing all the great things best we can do. I'm sure there are questions. There was one raised in the chat. Um, I think it was on page nine or so. Um, uh, Master Hilton was asking, what are the blue dots in the strong phase plot? Here? Yes, uh, blue, I think so. Uh, the, the model prediction using the, I think it's a, a bell model. Yeah. Ah, like, like the standard model, like prediction? Um, it's, it, it's from the amplitude analysis. Oh, okay, great. With, with I think it's an uh, amplitude analysis of, uh, from Bell and Barbar, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, myself, I had also a question on the page before, uh, and you were also like talking about um, extracting the, uh, I think it was on page eight, uh, the K short pi pi, uh, D to K short pi pi, where you extract the face so very nicely so that you can use it as an input. And um, how, how large is actually um, the the error on, on these those phases like coming from the model? Like, uh, I, I guess there's a systematic error which is assigned from, from, from the model dependence on those phases. Uh, this is a model independent measure. Uh, oh, right. uh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, so how would big is the, the error in, in the end then on, on, on those phases? Uh, you mean, uh, which, which, sorry, which? This, which this is, how, how big is the error on the strong phases that you extract from the, in the model independent um, extraction? Like, overly, uh, like? Uh, Sorry, sorry. Uh, this is just one degree, I guess. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, so for the gamma measurement, it's one all right. degree. Okay, yeah. very nice. Okay, are there other questions? Please raise your hand. You can also use the MetaMost channel after after the session uh, to continue discussions. So uh, thank you very much again for your talk. Okay, thank and you. I think we should move to the next one, uh, given by Juan Ruiz Vidal. Can you please try to share your slides? And he was to speak about CP violation and mixing and charm at Edish CB. So yeah, I will be presenting the some recent results on uh, mixing and CP violation in charm meson decay. Uh, LACD. So, yeah, uh, among these results, I'll be presenting the first observation of the mass difference between neutral D eigenstates that um, was nicely introduced yesterday by Malcolm in the plenary session. So, uh, by mixing, uh, we refer to the oscillating pattern between flavor eigenstates of uh, neutral mesons. So uh, while these are always produced in the flavor eigenstate, D0 or D0 bar, um, to propagate, they propagate in the mass eigenstate, which uh, leads to this uh, oscillation. This is characterized by these two parameters, Y, that is the decay with difference of the mass eigenstates, H and L uh, stand for heavy and light, and X. And today uh, I will be presenting the first observation of at more than five sigmas uh, of the parameter x different than zero. This is a big deal in charm because of the very slow mixing in uh, these zero mesons. Uh, in particular, the, the oscillation period in this meson is more than a thousand times uh, longer than the lifetime itself of the mesons. So, so we need a huge amount of data to really observe these, uh, these very small effects. And as you can see in this table, E2 Canti 2012, to have the first uh, observation by a single experiment, actually LACD, of, uh, of, uh, of the observation of the mixing uh, in, in charm. So, but with this, we can also probe uh, CP violation um, in the mixing and in the interference between the mixing and the decay. And uh, the third way also to look, search for CP violation is through direct CP asymmetries, which I will also uh, treat in other analysis. So we jump directly to this uh, nice result of um, the mass dif observation of the mass difference between neutral D eigenstates. And for that, we use the mode uh, D0 going to K short pi pi. Um, this, uh, this final state can be accessed both to D0 and D0 bar. However, um, in the Dalit plot here, we have that the, the most favored uh, intermediate resonance to access this final state is uh, pi plus K star minus, which is actually Kabibo favored for D0. However, if the D0 mixes into D0 bar, then 
the Kabibo favor mode will be the one with opposite charge, which we will see in the DALI plot as a vertical line or vertical band instead of an horizontal one. So uh, with uh, this uh, Talitz plane, we see how uh, measuring in general the ratio between the upper part of the Dalit plane and the lower one, that uh, gives us information of the amount of mixing in the, in the neutral emissions. To reduce to the minimum the dependence on the amplitude uh, model and also on the efficiency variations that we have in the detector, uh, the LACB used the beam flip method, <coughs> which consists on dividing the Dalit's plane in beams with uh, approximately constant strong phase. This uh, strong phase, which was uh, very nicely introduced in the previous talk, we have to take from uh, machines that have a coherent production of D and D bar, like the three or clear. So how this method uh, works is that we take the ratio between the symmetric beams along the bisector, uh, and then we study the time evolution of this ratio, okay? So, but we can do this in two ways. We can take uh, the two samples that have an initial D0 or D0 bar and average them. And with that, we access to the parameters X and Y in the CP conserving limit. But if we separate the two samples with initial D0 and D0 bar and look at the difference, we can access CP violation. In this case, through these delta X and delta Y parameters that are directly related to the commonly known uh, phi F and Q over T. So the results in the first case, first case aberrating over initial D and D0 bar, uh, we see in this plot how the hypothesis of X being equal to zero uh, represented by the red line is excluded with more than seven sigma significance, okay? So this represents actually the first observation of a mass difference between neutral D eigenstate. On the other side of the slide, if we separate the D0 and D0 by D0 bar samples, we can uh, do, the difference, do the difference between these ratios. And if we observe a non-zero value in these ratios, that will be a sign of CP violation. And this allows us to measure delta X and delta Y, which are both compatible with zero or CP conservation uh, within two sigma. Now, if we take these measured parameters and translate them to the usual X, Y, and Q over P and phi F, we can see what is the impact of this measurement on the world average. So, uh, here in this plot of X of Y against X, we see how there is an improvement on X by a factor of two on the world average. And there is also a very significant improvement in the CP violating parameters. In this case, phi F is around a factor three or four improved. Um, just a brief word, well, this analysis was actually uh, also very nicely presented by Jordi before the break. So I will not go in much detail, but uh, combining uh, many measurements of uh, LACB, we were also able to improve significantly the parameter Y, which was not much improved with the analysis I just showed. Okay, uh, now uh, I will present the results on the study of time dependent CP violation in the decay mode D0 going to H plus H minus, where the H can be a pion or a kion. So what we can do is build the commonly known uh, CP asymmetry, um, but study its time dependence. Since uh, in chart missions, this time, this mixing is very slow. We can do a Taylor expansion on this uh, decay asymmetry and just take the linear term on time. So in that way, we can access the parameter delta y, which provides access to CP violation. 
as in our sensitivity level is approximately equal to minus uh, delta uh, y, the one I introduced before. However, in the, in the detector, we don't measure uh, directly the clean CP asymmetry. What we do uh, quite literally is counting events with D0 and D0 bar and taking the normalized difference. But of course, uh, this has effects from the detector and the reconstruction. In particular, we have uh, some spurious asymmetries introduced by the reconstruction of the pi pion used for tagging and also from the production of the D star, which is the model particle of the D0. Uh, so in this case, we can eliminate the uh, time dependence of these uh, instrumental asymmetries just by equalizing the kinematic because they are correlated to the decay time and it is this difference which generates the asymmetry. And okay, uh, taking the samples from branch two, we have a huge amount of data of dozens of uh, millions of events. And I plot here the evolution in time uh, of these asymmetries, both for kaons and pions, which we find uh, compatible with zero at level of two sigma, and also compatible among them. Uh, these two measurements, or these two parameters, are expected to be the same up to very tiny correction. So uh, measuring the general delta y, this uh, measurement also has a very important impact on the world average as we have here. And uh, we have very nice prospects for these measurements for the run three, which is just starting. So- uh, Five minutes left. Okay. In the remaining of the talk, um, I will treat a somewhat more simple conceptually measurement that also gives us uh, some uh, in important information on other decay modes. So first is the decay rate asymmetry for D0 going to K short, K short. This, uh, the asymmetry in this channel uh, was claimed uh, to be to be large by some theory prediction. It will be up to the level of 1%. However, these claims are much debated uh, right now. But anyway, it's, it's very important to have the experimental measurement. So to reconstruct these uh, events, uh, reconstructing K-shorts is challenging in, at LACB because of the very long lifetime of uh, K-shorts. Depending on whether they um, decay within the vertex locator modules or, uh, or afterwards, we will have different categories. So the K-short decaying to pi pi can be reconstructed as uh, long. That means it leaves traces in all the detectors or, or as down. So we have three categories mixing these two K-shorts. So um, again, we have these spurious asymmetries that in this case we correct using the calibration sample of DC to K K. And in total, we have a yield of around 8,000 events, uh, from which we uh, extract the CP asymmetry that is actually the, the measurement with the lowest uncertainty today. It's also very com uh, competitive with the Bell measurement in 2017. And, and yeah, it's also compatible with uh, zero at two sigma more or less. Uh, the last analysis I will present is the same decay rate asymmetry, but in this case with neutral mesons in the final state, meaning pi zero and eta. So uh, among these is um, particularly interesting the mode D plus going to pi plus uh, pi zero which in some models, for example, in set prime models, here studied by uh, Hila, Gisbert, and collaborators, it, uh, it can have the same size as the delta ACP, also measured by LACB, around 10 to the minus three. Uh, this reconstruction of neutrals is uh, challenging at LACB, so we chose 
uh, decay modes of the pi zero and eta in which they decay into e plus e minus gamma or gamma gamma with a posterior uh, conversion to e plus e minus. Uh, okay, I don't have time to discuss all of this. In, in this case, we use as a control mode uh, k short pi plus. And uh, so to remove the spurious asymmetry. And uh, when with all these uh, signal events, we do a simultaneously to all the et eta modes and separately to all the pi zero modes. And this allows to keep the correlation that uh, theorists are always asking for. So here are the results of the direct uh, CP asymmetry on seven different channels, five of which are the best, uh, world best measurements today. And yeah, these also have very significant improvements for the world average with an, uh, they are all compatible with CP. So as a conclusion, uh, LHCB collected the largest data sample of uh, charm decays. In 2021, we have published very, very important results with world best uh, measurements. I reported the mass difference in D0 mesons, also introduced yesterday by Malcolm, and the simultaneous determination of CK and gamma and charm mixing parameters, explained before the break by Jordi. And there are also other results that will be explained uh, by Dominic later today on the measurement of CP violation in rare charm decays. So we saw a, best, a great performance of LHCB in rank two with many measurements have improved beyond the naive uh, scaling with the square root of the luminosity. And we have very exciting prospects for rank three with the upgraded LHCB detector. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for showing all of these great results. Are there questions? Please raise your hand. What are actually the prospects for, for the error of D2K short K short um, in run three? Like uh, how much will it be able to, to push it down? Um, so I don't have the specific number, but in this case is very significant because one of the problems of the K-shorts in LACB is that we cannot trigger on them because if they decay uh, after the develop. But uh, now we are developing a software-based trigger that will allow to also trigger on them uh, also using tracks in the downstream station. And I mean, uh, for the categories of down, down, down and long down, you can expect a huge improvement, but yeah, I don't have a number with me now. That's very nice to hear. Like, so maybe we are maybe we are close to another discovery soon. That's great news. Any other questions? And as usual, you can also write later on MetaMost uh, again. So thank you very much again, okay. and I guess we move to the next talk. Uh, by Radek on charm and time dependent CP violation in BDKs at Bell 2. And as usual, I will give you a um, heads up uh, five minutes before the end of the talk. Uh, so I hope you can hear me well. Just confirm. Yes, we can hear you very well. Uh, great. Uh, so I am from Bell 2 and I will speak about basically uh, so analysis so about the measurement of the oscillation frequency in the early Bell 2 data, then about the CP violation in the sine of 2, phi 1, and in the end the lifetime measurement of the of the D meson. And what is common for all of these is that they rely on the displaced vertices. Uh, and the time measurement from them. So just to introduce the first part, so over the last 20 years, there was a huge progress in the determination of the unitarity triangle, uh, so mainly due to the B factories and uh, Bell uh, and um, LACB. And uh, hopefully, after 10 years with uh, more data, 
especially from Bell 2, where we expect to collect like 50 times higher luminosity than at Bell, uh, we, we are, should be able to uh, squeeze the uncertainty in the unitarity triangle to the sub percent level. And uh, in my talk, in the first part, I am focusing on the angle beta, where currently the, uh, the measurements from Bell, Babar, and LACP have uh, similar precision. And then also on the uh, mixing frequency, BB bar mixing frequency, which is related to the length of the uh, side in the triangle attached to the beta angle. And here uh, the precision is dominated by the LACB, but for us, it's still useful to measure it uh, as a, as a cross-check. Uh, I think I don't uh, need to talk again about the CP measurement in the, in the mixing. Just, uh, yeah, let me say that Basically, there are two types of the decays uh, of the CP symmetric uh, decays, which we can measure in, uh, with uh, lower luminosity at Bell 2. We focus on the three level channels, but with more data collected, we should be able to measure also the uh, loop induced decay channels, and which are rare, and there is uh, like bigger room for the new physics. Uh, for the uh, for the time dependent uh, CP uh, V measurements at Bell two, we use the trick of the asymmetric uh, beams with the asymmetric beam energy, similar as in the other B factories. Uh, compared to uh, to Bell one, let me just say that the asymmetry in the uh, beam energies is smaller, so the like distance between uh, the vertices of two Bs is smaller, typically 130 micrometers. And yeah, and from uh, these vertices, we are able to measure the time delta T, which was in the, on the previous page. So there is a connection between the distance measurement and the, and the time measurement. Uh, so concerning the uh, delta T determination, as I already said, uh, the boost or the asymmetry between the beam energies at Bell 2 is smaller. However, we are able to measure the vertices with better precision, as you can uh, see from the left plot. And that's mainly due to the pixel detector, which was installed at Bell 2 and uh, where the sensors are about one centimeter away from the interaction point. And let me stress that uh, at uh, Bell 2, we have like full control over the kinematics of the event. So we know the uh, velocity of the Upsilon 4S uh, system. We know its energy, which is uh, the same as the uh, collision invariant uh, energy. And we also know the, like the, uh, distribution of the primary vertices, uh, which we also call the beam spot. And when speaking about the, uh, the beam spot uh, at Bell 2, there's a, a nice advantage that uh, uh, the beam spot is very narrow, especially in the y, y direction where there is, it's less than one micrometers in, in size. And uh, we can use, uh, like we measure this beam spot position and size continuously. And uh, from this knowledge, we are able to like um, constrain the kinematics of the, uh, of the both, both Bs and to increase the precision on, in the measurement of the, of the vertices. Uh, the, another important aspect is the the alignment of the of the tracker so the knowledge of the precise positions of the sensors and uh, recently we were also able to include the alignment of the wires in the in the drift 
chamber uh, to the to the alignment and uh, so uh, currently we the uh, align like uh, 60 uh, 60,000 parameters and uh, you can uh, see from this plot that the alignment uh, reduces the the residuals uh, and also one is able to uh, get uh, lower systematic uncertainties for example the plot on the on the bottom right maybe if the alignment is perfect it should be just the the curve should be just flat and at zero so there should be no dependence between the angle of the track and, the, and this z zero uh, so uh, let me start with the first results. So uh, this is the measurement of the mixing frequency between B0 and anti-B0. And uh, this analysis is uh, still with quite small luminosity of uh, 35 inverse femtobands. So it's dominated by the, by the statistical uncertainty. The result is compatible with the uh, PDG value with the word average, and uh, I, I hope I can say that we are just finalizing the um, like uh, better better analysis with much more data included, where the uh, precision will be higher. Uh, the another measurement is the uh, measurement of the sign of two beta on, again on the early bell two data of 35 inverse femtobands and uh, we are again compatible with the word average uh, but we are clearly dominated by the statistical uncertainty and uh, we need uh, much more data to be competitive uh, but uh, but as I as I said, it, it should be uh, the case. Uh, in the second second part of my talk, uh, I will speak about the D, D lifetime measurement and looking at the previous uh, results. Let me uh, just uh, stress that the most precise estimate is from the photo production. Uh, and there's only one measurement from the E plus E minus from Cleo. And there are no results from uh, Lab, Babar, uh, or Bell, one, or even LHCB. LHCB uh, measured the lifetime of the other charm uh, mesons, but the, uh, uh, these are always measured with respect to the, uh, to the D, D lifetime actually. So then we will be able to uh, measure D lifetime more precisely. We will also like increase the precision of the LHCB uh, measurements. And yeah, there are many uh, D mesons produced at uh, Bell 2. Uh, and let me uh, show you the, uh, the idea behind. Uh, so there's a uh, D star meson produce at the, in the interaction point, then uh, it decays to uh, D plus or um, to pi plus or pi zero. And then there's a uh, displaced vertex and uh, uh, D, uh, D zero or D plus is about 200 or 500 micrometers away. Uh, and uh, what we, how, how we reconstruct the time, so for us, it's the uh, like we reconstruct it from the distance between the uh, between the production vertex and then the and the D zero decay vertex, uh, like project it um, to the direction of the uh, D zero uh, or D plus uh, momentum. Uh, so by definition, this quantity, this time, can be can be also also negative. And this is actually a nice thing to, to see, the, see the resolution effects, since if the resolution is perfect, there should be no uh, negative times reconstructed. And five uh, minutes left, please. Yeah, thanks. thanks. And uh, basically, 
uh, we see a resolution of 70 uh, femtoseconds for the D0 and 60 femtoseconds for the, for the D plus uh, uh, channel. Uh, for the D plus, we have a bit, uh, we, we have some small fraction of background, about 9% 9, 9 for the D0, the background is, uh, can, be clear, um, can be neglected. And uh, just uh, let uh, me stress that uh, our resolution, uh, our time resolution is much better than it was at Bell or Babar, as I said, um, for none of these, there, were, um, there wasn't any measurement of the, of the lifetime, but uh, we can still look at the uh, T-curve for both of them. And we can see that the, the, the tile on the left uh, is larger compared to Bell 2. Uh, how, how is the uh, fit, uh, fit perform? So it's the 2D fit where we take both the T and the uncertainty of the T uh, from, the, from the vertex, uh, vertexing as uh, is variables in the fit. And we perform this fit uh, in the signal region and then also in the sidebands. And in this way, we are able to better constrain the, the background, which we assume to have the similar shape in the, in the delta, uh, in the T, T variable for sidebands and for the signal region. And we also assume that the resolution function uh, describing the, uh, the delta T resolution effects is same. Uh, so uh, let me uh, show the, the results. Uh, so, uh, with uh, this 72 inverse femtobarns of the Bell 2 data, uh, we were actually able to achieve the world leading precision. So for both D0 and D plus, we are better uh, than, the, than the PDG values. And uh, we are still uh, statistically uh, dominated uh, but uh, the systematic uncertainty is just a bit, bit smaller, and uh, the most important source is, uh, is the detector alignment or the uh, background uh, model in case of the of the D plus lifetime. Uh, so let me uh, conclude. Uh, so first, I show the like the uh, measurement of the uh, mixing frequency and the. Uh, signed to, to beta with the early Bell 2 data with quite low precision, but the, but the measurement with the more data is in progress. And as you can see on the, on the right, uh, during 2021, we really collected a lot of data and uh, our luminosity is getting to be comparable to, to Bell 1. And in the second part, I shown you the world uh, most precise determinations of the D plus and D zero lifetimes. Uh, and yeah, uh, let me say that more time lifetimes are, are coming uh, on the way. So stay tuned. Thank you very much for the very nice talk, showing all these nice results. I'm sure there are questions. Please raise your hand. Yes, Dominic, please. Hi, th thanks a lot for, for the nice level of the talk. Uh, very nice to see um, how the analysis are getting more and more precise with the new Bell data. So I, I have a question to the very um, the very last slide, the one you show now. Oh, um, this one. Okay. Yeah, so in the very bottom, you say that you are going to measure more charm lifetimes, also lambda C and the uh, Omega C, um, do you do you have an idea of what the position will be? Will it be comparable to the LHCB precision that we have on, on them? Yeah, yeah, I, uh, we we hope so. Ba basically, the yeah the main difference is that we we should be able to measure like the 
you know, the absolute values, not, not, with, reflect, uh, not with respect to the other lifetimes. And so even if we are not, uh, <laughs> not the world, world leading, we st there is still this advantage that it's the absolute uh, determination without, without use of any reference. So yeah, but you will see some results I think should uh, come already for on Morion. Okay, nice. Because you know when when we published the um, the lifetime of the Omega and LCD, that triggered quite a bit of uh, attention because we saw a different hierarchy than previous experiments. So it would be very nice to could. Uh, uh, yes, yes. It's online. always nice to you know to compare results from uh, completely different experiments with different systematics and so on. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, thanks a lot. Stefan, you are muted. I'm saying thanks. <laughs> yeah, thanks. For, um, are there further questions? Um, so I was just asking, um, is there a particular reason uh, why Bell and um, Lab and Baba all did not present um, the lifetime measurements? Yeah. So for the uh, for the Bell, I can say that there was a, there was an attempt, there is some like analysis note that, but in the end it was never never finished. So. Uh, yeah, yeah, but uh, as I, as I uh, said from this story, toy data from Bell and Babar, we can see that the that the resolution would be would be of course worse for for Bell. So yeah, uh, but I am not not sure what was exactly the history history behind. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Any further questions for Radek? If not, then let's thank you again. And uh, thanks, everyone. Thank you. And let's move to the next talk given by Lang Sing on the electronic DD case at uh, best three. And I will notify you again at uh, five minutes before. Yeah, hello. Can you hear my voice and see my sharing slides? Uh, we see your slides, but uh, they are not yet in full screen mode. Now they are in uh, full screen. Yes. Right now it works? Yeah, now it works. Okay, thanks. I will just, uh, yeah. Shall, shall I begin? Yes, please go ahead. Okay, hello everyone. I'm Lan Xinli from the University of Manchester. Today, I want to give you a talk about the semi lepton charm medicine decay at the best three. Next is just my outline. I will give you a talk about firstly, call about the mean goals and the, give an introduction of the best three defector and talk about the pure leptonic decay and semi lepton decays and the final part is just a summary. So firstly, why we give an abundant research on the pure or semi lepton decay of charm medicine. And here I suggest to my diagram of the pure or semi lepton decay and semi lepton decays. I mean, in, in this model, the straw and the, the big interaction can be well separated since the lepton did, did and doesn't participate, participate in the strong interaction, which leaves us a perfect platform to just explain the process of this decay in theory. And the amplitude of this decay can be driven by the product of the leptonic and the hydronic current. Uh, and where the, we are the lepton, leptonic current can be write, written directly and the hydronic current can be parameterized by the just the form factor and the, the decay constant shown in these equations. Thus, a precious measurement of the branching fraction of the uh, these decays allow us a current determination of the CKM matrix elements and a stretching test on the unitary of the CKM matrix, which is sensitive to the new physics. And also the measurement of the form factor and the, the decay constants allow us to calibrate the latex QCD calculations. And also with this pure or semi leptonic decays, we can then give a test on the lepton flavor universality, which is also important to search for new physics. And here is just a quick introduction on the electron positron collider we use, the BPC2. The BPC2 collider is just a double ring collider, which is the only one working on the charm three shot. Uh, with the design center of, of center of mass energy from 2.0 to 4.95 GeV. And the best rate detector is just the spectral matter built on the BCC2, which is designed to fulfill the physical requirements of BCC2. And here I just show the inner structure of the best rate detector and also the mean resolution for the different sub detectors shown below. And working to know the best rate has collected the world's largest threshold for set two prime and the DIS data symbol of which the details are shown in this table. And we mainly use the data symbol collected at the 3.773 GB uh, 
to take a research on the dimensions and the other data sample height from the 4.178 GV to 4.226 GV is used to research on the DS mass decays. And uh, when, central mass, when central of mass energy equals to 3.773 GV, the decay chain will be predominated by the E plus E minus decay to the first prime and the decay to the D, D plus D, D, D bar. And the when central mass of energy is in the range of 4.178 to the 4.26 GV, uh, the the main products of our decay just the DS DS star where 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 the DS star will then decay to the gamma DS. And using this property type, we can just introduce the double tag method to study our decay. And the double tag single events just consist of a single type D or DS candidate, which is the, accompanied by a single candidate. And then in our experiment, the single type D or DS candidate will be fully reconstructed by the several hydronic decays we will gen we generally use in our pre um, previous research. And there are, there are two parameters, just like just shown here, the beam constraint mass for the D decay and the recoil mass for the uh, DSD case is used to extract the single tag yields. And for the double tag events, due to the undetectable neutrino in the final state, which usually just def defines the variables of the mixing mice, or uh, the similarly Yomi is shown in, in these two equations to just add, to use them to extract the double tag yields. And combining the single tag yields and the double tag yields, and also the re reconstructing efficiency, we can then just measure the single branch infection, just shown as in the middle equation. And the law that's regarding the fuel electronic decay, we have shown the relevant fuel diagram and the result of the attitude for the fuel electronic decay here. And after we measure the decay rates, we can then combine the CKM matrix element from CKM tracer to calculate the decay constant, and also combine the decay constant calculated from the latex city to obtain the CKM matrix elements. And uh, so, <laughs> Firstly, here is about the improved measurements of the DS plus decay to the tonio, the tau plus decay to the indonio. And here is the data sample used in this measurement just, cor just corresponds to the uh, intergravity of 6.72, uh, 6.32 pentobiron inverse 1 um, uh, uh, collected at the central mass energy from 14.178 to 4.26 GeV. And the two here to effectively distinguish signal from the background. We introduce the variable of the e total actual, which is defined as the total energy of the good EMC shower, uh, excluded those associated with the single tag uh, candidate and also those with the final state radiation from the positron tracks. And in the e total extra distribution, the signal candidate you can see here in the plot, the signal candidate will just accumulate below 0 0.4 GeV. Thus, we can then determine the signal yields in, the, in this energy range by just means of the counting cut method. Which, which means that we can just statistically subtract the different sources of expected backgrounds from the total double tag, year, double tag event numbers below 0 0.4 GV. And this just makes sure the procedure is insensitive to the signal shape. And from the measurements, we have shown the option branch infection as, uh, as well as the product of CKM matrix and the decay constant below, uh, which is the most precious data result to the data whose precision is improved by a factor of two compared to the pressure previous best result of the decay. And then is the measurement of all the DS plus decays the tau nu, where tau plus will decay to the pi, pi plus pi zero nu. And with the same data samples we used before to obtain the signal use, we just perform a simultaneous feed to the missing mass squares distribution, where the six energy point in shared with a common electronic branch infections we control. And from the feed, we can also then measure the signal use and the further Obtain the branch infection of the decay as well as the, as well as the product just shown here. And this is about the combined measurement of DS plus decay to the tonio and DS plus decay to the mu nu. And we give a measurement of these two decays at the same time, where we just separate our data sample by the energy of the uh, by, the, by the energy of shower in EMC uh, into the mu-like data samples and pi-like data samples to better measure, measure each data decays. And we then take the arm in the simultaneous feed in the to the two dimension distribution between the missing mass squares and the environment, environment mass of the DS mason, where the feed parameters are floated freely, but the ratio of the signal yields between the two data samples is fixed. And here we give an example of our feed result in the energy point of 4.178 GV, uh, GV. And combining all data samples results, we can then measure the branch infection of the tonio model and the mu model. Here is the signal scale, and the branch, branch infection value is shown here. 
and we also also shown the relevant product here. And the branch infection for the Munio model shown here is just the most precious result of the data. And the combining the results from B3 measurement and the PGD 2020 video, here we just summarize the measured branch infection for the DS plus because the Tom you can see here in this plot. And uh, with the most precious branch infection of the DS plus because the Tom you and the static branch infection of DS plus because the mu new model, we can then calculate the ratio of this amplitude and to be 9.76, and which is consistent with the predict value in standard model. Which means that no lactam flavor universality variation in tomu flavor with, within the current uh, current position has been observed. And as we said previously, we can also measure the decay constant value and the second matrix value even individually by separately in, inserting those two theoretical values into the product we just measured. And here I just firstly show the comparison of the decay constant by importing the CKM matrix value VCS from the CKM global feed into the product we just measured. And in this plot, the result with the right color is just the recent work I have I gave in production in this plot and the blue one just the previous result. And uh, you can see that with the combined result of the mu model and the tonu model, we can obtain the combined CK uh, constant value, which whose precision is constrained to closely one percentage. And similarly, we have shown the comparison of the second matrix values VCS by inputting the decay constant from the latex QCD coefficient into the product. And here is the same, the red color is just the recent result, recent work. I will give a talk in this, I will give introduction in this talk. And the precision of the combined result is also constrained to closely one percentage. And now let's move to the semi leptonic decay of the charm medicine. The formula of the amplitude of the charm decay to the cellular scalar is shown here. And uh, <coughs> here and besides the branch infection we measured, we, also, we are also interested in the form factor, which it describes as just the strong interaction between the final quarks. And in this, and, uh, and the first day I want to show you the analysis of the, about the DPAS decays for ETA mu nu. The data sample used in this measurement corresponds to an integrated, uh, to an integrated luminosity of 2.92 femtobaron inverse one, <coughs> collected as the central mass energy in uh, equals to the 3.773 GeV. And by an unbeam fit to the Yomi distribution of data sample, we can obtain more than 200 data signal events with, with larger than 10 sigma significance. We can then determine the branch infections of this decay uh, uh, shown here and uh, combining the branch infection, measure branch infection with that of the electron models set it from the PG. We also calculated the ratio between the branch infection of the new, new channel and the electron channel, which is consistent with the standard model prediction and indicates that no lactam flavor universality violation is observed within the current sensitivity. And besides the branch infection we measured in this analysis, we are also studying the dynamics of this PK for the first time. Five minutes factor, left, please. Yeah, Sorry. The form factor is parameters by the two parameter series expansion model in the feed. We have also shown the results of the, our measured form factor here. You can see. And then it's about the measurement of the branch infection of the T0 decay to the axial vector mass and K1 in yield. And in this analysis, to obtain the reliable signal yields of the decay, we take a two dimensional simultaneous, simultaneous, simultaneous feed to the two dimensional distribution of mean sigma square. And the environment, environment mass of the k pi pi, which is a which are just a sub, sub particles of k1. And we are the fit, fit in the different energy points that share with the same value of the branch, measured branch infection. The measured of the measured signal yields and the calculated branch infection is also shown in this slide. And this is the first measurement of the of this k of which the system is so significant is larger than 10 sigma. And combining the measured branch infection of the P0 and the cited P plus semi decay to K1, we also give a test on the SFB symmetry, which is uh, a great with the standard model prediction. And here we also show the measurements of the inclusive branch infection of the DS decay to the X EMU, where we sort our recurve side and chart track into 18 momentum beams uh, with a total requirement of the momentum larger than 200 due to the bad and identification of electron lower than 200. And the signal used with the momentum below 200 is then determined by extrapolation of the signal shape via the field to the momentum 
distribution more than 200. And the final signal yields is just the sum of these two values. And the measurement, the measured signal yields along this uh, brand, of the branch infection are both shown in this slide. And the, the branch infection we measured in this analysis is consistent but equal by the factor of 2.5 compared to the measurement from the field. And using the branch infection of known DS equal safety decays, we found that no evidence for the existence of the unobserved DS semi-logical decay models. And then we also calculated the ratio between the amplitude of the interval branch infection of DS and the D0, which is consistent with to the theoretical prediction. And here's just the measurement of branch infection of the other decay to the K minus EO and DS decay to the K0 EO. We just propose a new method to, to measure the branch infection with where we use the same, same logical decay as our type, and we also show our branch infection measurement branch infection as a test on the SMB symmetry here. And the results just support the SMB symmetry within the 1.96 mark. The next is about the DLR decay to the zero EU. And in this analysis, we measure the branch infection uh, for the first time which with the with the signal significance with the signal significance larger than 10 finger for the first time. And we determine the branch infection of our decay and give a test of uh, also give a test on the lepton flavor universal, universality shown as below, and which is consistent with the standard model prediction. And here is just uh, some other decay. Other recent analysis of the semi decay decays of the trimester from the best three. And this result are also very important from our, for our analysis, but we won't give a detailed introduction to them due to the limited time. And it's just a summary. Uh, with the current data sample, the best three has re re reported the risk result with input precision for the DS lab decay, plus decay to the tonio, mionio, and uh, inclusive measurement on the X inio models. And we also give a first opposition for the D plus decay to the eta mu the K1 EU, and also the DLR decay to the Rho mu, of which the both statistical significances are larger than 10 sigma. We also give a first measurement in the dynamics of the D plus decay to the eta mu and in the future, the best three will just collect the more data samples in the energy point of 3.773 GeV and the 4.178 GeV, which means the precision of our experiment will be further improved. For example, uh, with the exactly 20 frontal bearing inverse one data samples of C and seven and three JV, we, uh, we expect to give an improved measurement on the D0 decay to K minus EU and the D0 decay to the pi minus EU. Where we expect to improve the precision of the relevant decay constant. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much for the very nice talk, showing so many great results. So, as a question, Christine, yes. Yes, please. Hi, thank, thanks very much for that interesting talk. It was great to see um, such good results. So I had a, a comment, really, and a, a comment slash question on your slide number eight. OK. Yeah. Where you talk about the um, D, D sub S leptonic decay. Now, I'm a lattice yes. person, so obviously I'm interested in converting your results for the, the rate or the width into a value for VCS. And I just had a comment here. Because your results are becoming so accurate now, you've got to be a bit more careful about this formula. And there is uh, a renormalization of the GF there oh, from oh, electroweak yeah. corrections. And of course, one does also have to worry about electromagnetic corrections to this formula. So what you're yes. determining here really is not the decay constant times VCS, it's the decay constant times VCS times the renormalization of GF. Yes, yes. And that's, <laughs> that, that is about 1.009 for your calculation. So that if you look at your values for VCS that you determined on, I can't remember what slide that was, um, actually you should be getting slightly smaller numbers. I See your number. You you had nine point seven six. It should really be nine point. You had point yeah. nine seven six. It should really be point nine six seven. If you yes. put in the theta electro week, and then that agrees really nicely with the value for VCS that we got using your D to K semi leptonic results, the HPQCD results that Will Parrot talked about this morning. So, you know, that's all all becoming yeah, a very I, nice picture and a very consistent picture here. I think. Yes, yeah, thanks very much for your very helpful comment. And I think it's indeed one point which should just pay attention to for the next uh, report, maybe. <laughs> thanks very much. Yeah, OK, good. Great, thanks very much. Are there more questions? Martin, yes, please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks yeah. for your nice talk. 
I have one question um, concerning um, other possible measurements. So um, like uh, D to K star L nu um, and uh, specifically whether an angular analysis is possible there um, at uh, this three. So, uh, which, mean, which case you mean? No, no, D to K star L oh, nu. Oh. Uh, yes, it's uh, one one with uh, one research about the electronic decay model. We take a research, but right now the result is not uh, published yet, and it's still in the inter. And so we di I didn't show the result of that here. And I think maybe in the future time we, we can give a much more precious result for the SDK models. Right, but but what are you measuring exactly there? Uh, <laughs> sorry, I'm and right. I'm not very clear about the future plan of that. Okay, thank you. Okay, any more questions? In any case, you can contact the all speakers also uh, later after the session. Yes, so let's say, thank you again, Langsing, and let's yes, move sir. to the last um, talk of the session uh, by Dominic on rare charm decays at LHCB. Hi. And I will give you a five minutes uh, heads up again. Thank you a lot. So let me share my screen. Yes, we can see your slides. They are not yet in full screen. Yeah. Okay. What about that? Can you see it okay? No, it's in full screen, yes. Okay, thanks a lot. So, all right, then uh, thanks a lot. I'm, I'm Dominic. And I have the pleasure now to talk about rare charm decays at LHCB. So yeah, we, have, we heard a lot about rare decays in the conference already, but it was mostly about um, B decays. Okay, um, so rare charm is this really a unique probe of uptight quark CNCs. And as, as such, it's also complementary to what we're doing in the B and the K1 sector. So since we have that almost exact gym cancellation in CTU-aware processes, not only we have sensitivity to orthogonal couplings, also we have a very specific phenomenology, meaning that we have extremely suppressed rates, so typically in the order of 10 to the minus 10, can be enhanced by resonances, that makes also uh, theoretical predictions sometimes challenging. Then since we have very small CT symmetries in the charm system in general, um, given the sensitivities we have in radicase, we can consider CP as an approximate symmetry of the system, so for us CP symmetries are essentially expected to be zero. And we have a very specific angular distribution. So since there's no XL vector coupling and lab concurrence, um, it means that parity is also a conserved, conserved quantity in the lepton system. So parity is also a symmetry of the system in red charm. So the way to go in, in red charm is to try to exploit the symmetries we have in the standard model and then to test the standard model using clean null tests, which can be um, the one inside searches for extremely rare and forbidden decays, or also um, studies of the peer symmetries, angular distributions of resonance dominated semitonic decays. And that is the view we've done quite a, a lot of these kind of searches in the past. When you physics searches in rare charm, so focusing on searches in branching ratios, so especially in regions of the phase space away from resonances. So we did searches for leptonic decays, um, three, four body decays, so even baryonic decays. And then more recently, we also started to look for new physics, doing these null tests based on symmetries of the system, such as, such as for forbidden decays and studies of angular observables and CP symmetries, where we have that uh, very new analysis that I will present today. So today I will, I will a bit go through the menu and show the two most recent results of uh, our, our collaboration, focusing on both these approaches. And I wanna start with that analysis that is called searches for 25 rare and forbidden decays plus NDS mesons. So that's an analysis that we have published well, roughly a, a year ago. And what all these 25 decays have in common is the, that there's one hadron uh, in the final state, so a kaon uh, or a pion, and two leptons, so leptons, muons, or electrons. And then basically you can form all sorts of combinations. And a large amount of these uh, combinations is actually forbidden in standard model, so very clean null tests. Then another set is sensitive to the FCNC process. And we also use the, uh, the, uh, the resonant mode where the leptons come from intermediate phi as, uh, as a reference um, for our analysis. 
So how can we search for new physics in the other case? Well, for the forbidden mode, it's pretty uh, pretty obvious. So if you see a signal, then that's clearly a sign of new physics. For the non-forbidden mode, it's a bit more challenging because here we are really dominated by these intermediate resonances. And what that means is uh, shown here on the bottom that shows the branching fraction of the decay d to pi mu mu as a function of q squared. So q squared is just the mass squared of the immune system. And you see that really in orange showing the resonance uh, the, the standard model resonance contributions that we have the domination of the resonances across the full phase space, so even in, in the corners. So in blue, this is the non-resonance standard model contribution. And then yeah, compared to that in orange, the large contribution of the resonances. Nevertheless, what we can, there are some corners of the phase space here at high masses, for example, where we still can look for new physics, and some physics might lead to a significant enhancement of the branching ratio over the standard model background. So what we do. Uh, experimentally is that we remove uh, the, the regions of the resonances where they have the highest impact and we take the, the phi to the most dominant one as a reference and then we only search for the physics in those extreme regions of dimion mass. So what we want to do experimentally is to measure the branching fraction. Um, we do that in a relative approach. So effectively what we measure uh, is a ratio of branching fractions of the signal process over normalization and as normalization, as said, we choose the decay where the two leptons do come from that intermediate fine meson. So we measure the ratio of yields, we need the ratio of efficiencies, and in that relative approach, we need the branching fraction of the normalization mode here as external input. To give you some, um, some examples for the mass spectra, so we use the mass spectra to count uh, the signal candidates. Uh, what you see on the left is the normalization mode. So when the two muons come from an intermediate phi, the left peak is the D plus, and then a bit higher in mass, that's the DS, clearly separated from the muon mode. And on the right, as an example, it's one of the rare modes. So the final state is D to pi mu mu. So it's the same final state as on the left. But this time, the muons are required to be coming from the non resident region. And yeah, from in the mass spectrum, you, on the first glance, you might think you see some, two, some, some signal peaks, but actually, um, these are coming from background events here, the peaks. So D decays to three pions and then to a of pions are misidentified as leptons. So why you shift them a little bit in mass to the left with respect to the known mass of the D meson and the DS meson here it's shown in that red bar. So in the end, it turns out that the spectrum is fully described just by the background only hypothesis. And this is true for all these 25 decay channels. So the conclusion is that we do not see a significant signal here. But the analysis that I show is using a subset of our data sample. So uh, the data we have taken in 2016 um, and nevertheless, even though we don't see a signal, we use the information that we have and to set upper limits on the branching fractions and we improve the limits, the previously best limits by orders of magnitude. So what you see in the, in the two plots, it's the limits on the D plus mode on the left for the DS on the right. So the limit that we observe is that black cross and this can be then compared to the previous best limit here in green. And you really see that we are dominating the field and setting limits, improving limits by orders of magnitude which of course helps to set stringent limits on your physical couplings in those kind of processes. And just as a side remark that we are also working on, on the update using the full run two data set, which of course will help to furthermore uh, constrain new physical contributions in those two cases. So coming to the second big topic, which is the angular analysis of DDKs to um, pi pi and KK in final states and such was the p-violation. So this is now the most recent analysis that we have published in the field just about uh, three months ago, we submitted it to the archive. So those decays, D decays in two hadrons and two muons, they have been now the FCB, so we made first observation a few years ago. And even though they are fully dominated by resonances, um, they are the rarest charm meson decays that have been observed so far, and uh, with branching fractions in the order of 10 to the minus seven to 10 to the minus six, they are also as suppressed as, as what you know from typical deficit penguins, such as case done with me, for example. So in the past, we also made a measurement um, of some elect selected angular and superior symmetries using a subset of data. Now, today, for the very first time, we do a full angular analysis using all the data we have and selecting these that come from that decay chain of a charged D star to a D zero on the pion. And then when you look at, at the charge of that dome of the pion, it tells you the flavor of the D. And not only that, it also helps to greatly reduce the background as you can see on the right. So it's the finally selected 
a sample of Piper mu on the top and KK mu candidates. And you see that it's very clean and we have about what three and a half thousand Piper mu and about 300 KK mu decays now available for the angular analysis. So to describe the topology, um, it's a four body finite state. We need five independent variables. Uh, so what we use is P square, Q square, uh, so mass is both the muon and the dihedron system. And in addition, 3 decay angles. Uh, so you see that in sketch, um, theta mu is the angle of the mu plus in with respect to the flight direction of the dimuon system here, as seen from the rest frame of the D meson. Then symmetrically, the hadron helicity angle and that angle phi, which is the angle between the two decay planes of the two muon system and the two hadron system. Yeah, and then we can write the differential decay rate as this uh, large sum. Uh, so it's a sum of angular coefficients i times angular basis terms. So these basis terms are functions of theta mu and phi. And since we know that parity is conserved in the charm case, we immediately know that i567 have to vanish in the standard model for these are clean null tests. Um, still, these coefficients are functions of p square, uh, q square, both and beta h. So what we do is we provide an integrated measurement, we integrate the hadron system, and we define an integration scheme as is shown here in, in that little red box, and that is optimal under the assumption that we have a dominant p wave contribution in the hadron system. And since we have the flavor tag, we measure the coefficients for d and d bar separate. So what we give in the paper in the end is not the coefficients i, it's the flavor average, we call that S, and the CP asymmetries called A of those coefficients. And it's defined just as the average sum or the average difference, depending on if it's a CP even or CP odd coefficient. So you can account for the negative sign you get from the CP transformation. Yeah, again, due to parity invariance, S567 have to vanish um, since uh, we have that smallness of the P asymmetries, all these AI coefficients have to vanish. So I is going here from two to nine. Five minutes left, please. Thanks a lot. Yeah, in addition to the uh, to these angular observables, we also give an updated measurement of ACP. So that's the ACP asymmetry and the total decay rate, which then at the end gives us 17 observables uh, for each channel, out of which 12 have to vanish in the standard model. And we do the measurement uh, not only integrated in the muon mass, we also do it binned. So what you see on the right, um, this is the dimuon mass spectrum for Piper mu on the top and KK mu on the bottom. You really see the dominance of the intermediate resonances for omega phi. And in color, this is the binning scheme that we have cho chosen overlaid. Um, so we do not, we have not seen significant signal here in the gray region. So this is excluded. Um, and yeah, the reason why we do that measurement binned in, in, in bins of diamond mass is that we expect these resonance enhanced neophysic effects. And what that means is shown on the right. So since the new physics signal is driven by interference of new physics contributions and the resonance contributions, we expect the largest signals here in the vicinity of resonances. So what you see in the plot, this is new physics contributions to one of these coefficients, I6, as a function of Q square. And you really see that where we have the um, resonances in Q square, we expect the largest signals of new physics. This is very convenient to us. Yeah, so to give you some um, experimental details, we measure those coefficients via yield asymmetries. That means for each of the coefficients, you can find uh, an integration range uh, in, in the uh, decay angles um, such that you can measure the coefficient just by splitting the data according to a tag, which is defined by these integration ranges, and then computing the asymmetry, so just, just counting in the end, and that green is uh, a normalization. So for I6, it looks pretty simple just that simple uh, integration cos and theta mu. For the others, it might be a little bit more complicated, but if you're interested, then have a look at the paper where we expand the full formalism. And then we also do a couple of corrections. Um, so we correct for acceptance effects across the D phase space. We do corrections for nuisance asymmetries. So asymmetries related to detection asymmetries, production asymmetries when, when measuring ACP using control samples. And we do a lot of control um, like checks and uh, evaluation of systematic uncertainty. So typically, uh, systematics is something between 10 to 50% of the statistics. So we are really, really fully dominated by the statistical precision in the measurement. Yeah, now it's, it's time to, to come to the results. Uh, I don't want to show um, all the observables. I just made a small selection of the observables. And I picked um, the ones that have null tests, so S567, just for you to know S6 is it's essentially the forward-backward asymmetry of the muon system. 
So this is a five, six, seven on top for pi per mu on bottom for kk mu as a function of, of the muon mass. And well, given the, the uncertainties we have, all the individual points are indeed consistent with the error of the consistent with the standard model. However, we also see some interesting structure services so or some similar trend in S5, S6, and inverted trend in S7. So ideally, yeah, you want to make more sophisticated analysis in forms of global fits, and you are happily invited to do so. So if you look at the paper, you can get a tabulated version of the results and the full correlation matrix uh, for all the observables. So I also want to show some selected superior symmetries. Um, so I, what I show here is A6. So that's in some sense the superior symmetry of the forward vector symmetry. Um, A8, 9, those are, can be related to triple product symmetries. And ACP on the very right, again, for a pipe movement at the top and kq movement at the bottom. And also here within the uncertainties, um, it's consistent with the standard model with zero, although there are also uh, some regions in Q square, especially at low masses or okay, KKMU, where we have some deviation for the level of two, two, three, sigma, and sometimes even a bit more. So again, you, ideally you want to make some global analysis now. Um, so what we did is we, we just compute a global p-value with respect to the standard model hypothesis by considering only the null tests, so the observables where we know what to expect. So that's ACP, these A coefficient, and S567. And then we got a p-value of 79% for pi per mu and 28% for kq mu, which corresponds to 0.3 sigma and 2.7 sigma respectively. So it is to say again, consistent with the standard model, but uh, yeah, it's definitely something that we want to keep an eye on on how that involves in the future if we have more data in which direction that involves. So coming to my very last slide. So I, I try to, to highlight today that Red Charm is really unique and complementary field to look for physics. Now talking on behalf of LHCB, uh, we are doing major contributions to that field. So essentially all the measurements we report, report world's best result. So you've seen that we hold record for the rarest charm meson decays, also true for baryon decays, by the way. And we are doing pioneers work. So today we presented the very first angular analysis in the field. And yeah, keep, stay tuned. There, there's many updates analysis that will come uh, in, the, in the near future, exploring the full run two data set. For example, here, um, an updated measurement of the search ready to memory that comes out very soon. Uh, just to mention, we also work on relative uh, charm decays that I have not mentioned today. And the very last comment that all the analysis that we do are indeed limited by statistics. So that's really great prospects for, well, it's plural for the upgrades that will come in the future. Yeah, so if you want to know more, here's a, an article that I wrote together with some theory friends about the field. Um, so with that, I want to thank you a lot for all your attention and i'm happy to answer questions if there are any thank you very much for the great talk and other questions please raise your hand if so can you maybe comment on the on the future uh, projections like for the sensitivities of these null tests um, yeah we, we do have a, a table that we um, often show at conferences um it's that one i have in the backup so for so what you see in the top, this is uh, expected limits on benchmark channels and, and the bottom, this is expected sensitivities on, on asymmetries and altus. So you see that this is a bit conservative, um, but we should for pipe uh, we should go below the percent level um, with 15 or uh, And then, well, for actually for, for three vertical decays, even lower reaching the permit level. And then for the upgrade tool, you see yeah, getting even further down. And for D2 mu mu, you have uh, like four times sense of minus 10. Uh, do you, can you remind me what the standard model prediction is for, oh. for that mode? Um, if, you, uh, if you are in reach of the... No, no, no. For the standard model, it's still another at least two orders of magnitude. So uh, if I remember correctly, for D2 mu mu, the dominant one comes from the two photon intermediate exchange, which is 10 to minus 12 or something. So we are really... Uh, it's a lot, so if, let's phrase it positively, there's a lot of margin to observe uh, new physics until we reach standard model ground. Right, but still you are getting closer. Well, right. yeah. yeah. Are there further questions? I do not see any raised hands. So thank you very much again. And thanks also to all the speakers of this session and all of the other flavor sessions. And it was a great, it was really great sessions and um, yeah. So see you all back in the plenaries and have fun at the rest of the conference. Thank you very much.
Bye-bye.